Will the congregation please stand? Living and loving God, we come again to this place where you are worshipped as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We come to gather up all that we have said and done and thought since last we met and bring it as part of our offering of thanks and praise. We have come to seek your truth, to praise your glory, and to allow the light of your love to drive the darkness out of our lives. Father, we come in the name of Jesus, because He first came to us. We have come. Now fill us with Your Holy Spirit.
Lord be with you. We welcome one and all to this service, both here and those that will be participating at home. Please be seated. In Epiphany, we seek to see the light of the world shine, that light which fills the earth with grandeur that sometimes only poets see. Today, in the days following Scotland's traditional Burns Night, we shall give a nod to the words and tunes associated with Scotland's greatest bard, Robert Burns, to open our eyes to the light of Christ, that we might see Him more clearly in His own words about the blessed way of life. And so let us worship God. Robert Burns, by the popularity of his words, kept alive folk tunes that have survived to the present day, some even becoming associated with hymns. Our first hymn is to a tune called Caledonian Hunt's Delight. Burns himself tells the story of its origin. He wrote, Do you know the history of the air? It's, it is curious enough. A good many years ago, a Mr. James Miller was in company with our friend, the organist Stephen Clark, and talking of Scots music. Miller expressed an ardent ambition to be able to compose a Scots air. Mr. Clark, partly by way of joke, told him to keep to the black keys of the harpsichord and preserve some kind of rhythm and he would infallibly compose a Scots air. Certain it is that in a few days, Mr. Miller produced the rudiments of an air, which Mr. Clark, with some touches and corrections, fashioned into the tune in question. Burns chose Caledonian Hunt's delight to accompany his words, O, the banks and braes of Bonnie Doon, and we use them to sing this hymn, All Earth Was Dark Until You Spoke. Till every heart 
When from my mother's womb I fell, thou might have plunged me deep in hell to gnash my gooms and weep and wail in burning lakes where damned devils roar and yell, chained to their stakes. Yet I am here, a chosen sample, to show thy grace is great and ample. I'm here, a pillar o thy temple, strong as a rock, a guide, a ruler, and example to all thy flock. These are two stanzas from Burns's famous poem, Holy Willie's Prayer, which condemns the religious hypocrisy that he so despised. And so let us approach our God in prayer in true humility. And so let us pray. It is our desire to praise you, Lord God, because you are so worthy of our praise. We worship you and give you glory for what you have done, the majesty of your creation, the plan of salvation, the furtherance of your kingdom, the hope that is within us, the rebirth of our souls, and the revival we have seen in our lives. And we worship you and give you glory for who you are, If you had done nothing, your glory alone would be cause for us to fall down before you. Your very nature makes you worthy of our songs. You are good, mighty, majestic, and holy, and so accept our praise today. We come to confess that we have been hypocrites this week. We have said one thing and done another. We have proclaimed to be Christian and acted like pagan, bad examples to others by not practicing what we preached. We have done things to gain the acceptance and approval of others. We have been greedy and self-indulgent, willfully walking towards temptation and jumping headlong into it. We have strained our gnats and swallowed camels, as we have messed up our priorities, neglecting the more important matters of our faith, justice, mercy, faithfulness, and focused on less important matters. Forgive us for inverting our priorities and grieving your Spirit within us. We repent of our foolish ways and ask you to increase our desire to obey you, Accept our confession and repentance. Create in us a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within us. Restore the joy of your salvation. And grant us a willing spirit to sustain us. And all this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A Cotter's Saturday Night. Here is a stanza. The cheerful supper done with serious face, they round the angle form a circle wide, and the sire turns o'er with patriarchal grace. The Big Hall Bible and his father's pride. His bonnet reverently is laid aside, his lyre haffets wearing thin and bare. Those strains that once did sweet in Zion glide, he wails a portion with judicious care. And let us worship God, he says, with solemn air. And this is the stanza that is to introduce for us our readings for today. We hear again how Burns encapsulates the Old Testament. The priest-like fire father leads the sacred page. 
how Abraham was the friend of God on high, or Moses bade eternal warfare wage with Amalek's ungracious progeny, or how the royal bard did groaning lie beneath the stroke of heaven's avenging ire, or Job's pathetic plaint and wailing cry, or rapt Isaiah's wild sapphic fire, or other holy seers that tune the sacred lyre. Our Old Testament reading is taken today from the book of Micah. Micah was a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah, and so addressed the same social political issues confronting the nation of Israel. Indeed, both books contain a similar passage about beating their swords into plowshares. Micah is also quoted at Christmas as containing the passage about Bethlehem as the birthplace of the coming one. However, our reading today concludes with perhaps Micah's most quoted words. Hear the word of God. Our ears are open. A reading from the Old Testament, the book of Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Hear now how Burns describes the New Testament. Perhaps the Christian volume is the theme, how guiltless blood for guilty man was shed, how he who bore in heaven the second name had not on earth whereon to lay his head how his first followers and servants sped, the precept sage they wrote to many a land, how he who lone in Patmos banished saw in the sun a mighty angel stand and heard great Babylon's doom pronounced by heaven's command. Our New Testament reading is from the Gospel according to Matthew. In Matthew, Jesus is presented as a new Moses, a new lawgiver, and so over the next few weeks we will be looking at the first of the blocks of teaching spread throughout this book. It is commonly called the Sermon on the Mount, and we begin as it begins with the Beatitudes. A 
A reading from the New Testament, the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who, pers who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. And for the, in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be you. to God. The Cotter's poem describes not just reading the Bible, but also offering their praise to God in song. They chant their artless notes in simple guise. They tune their hearts by far the noblest aim. Perhaps Dundee's wild warbling measures rise, or plaintive martyrs worthy of the name, or noble Elgin beats the heavenward flame, the sweetest far of Scotia's holy lays. Compared with these, Italian trills are tame, the tickled ears no heartfelt rapture raise. Nay, unison they heard they with their our Creator's praise. As we continue our worship in song, but not to any ancient psalm tune, but to another of Burns's folk tunes, the irony of this one is it was first published by an Italian. Pietro Urbani. He said the words of my love is like a red, red rose to a tune, which he said was obligingly given to him by a celebrated Scots poet who was so struck by them when sung by a country girl that he wrote them down and not being pleased with the air begged the author to set them to music in the style of a Scots tune, which he'd done accordingly. Burns hated the tune. The version of A Red Red Rose that is popularly known all over the world uses the tune of a traditional song called Low Down Is The Broom. The melody was widely anthologized and Burns was familiar with it. In fact, he wrote to George Thompson in 1793, Low down in the broom, in my opinion, deserves more properly a place among your lively and humorous songs. We are going to sing it to a hymn for Easter. All at dawn, the woman made their way. Spice and sweet perfume to wear. 
done. Please be seated. It's not you yet. Well, actually it is. Sorry. My apologies. It is you. I have nothing more to say. Well, um, I was very delighted when um, Jack asked me if I would do the sermon today and linking um, Robert Burns with the Beatitudes. And uh, yes, so it was, it was, I said to Jack this morning, it was quite um, a task it turned out because I've got so many books and Burns that I was plowing through them all. And you know the old thing, you've got so much, so much material, you can't see the wood for the trees. But however, I got myself settled down and it came to me at last. Jesus had gathered together his group of disciples and had traveled through Galilee, healing many people and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. His popularity was growing. It was time now to take things a little further. The Sermon on the Mount was his first big teaching session in which he passionately pours out what a rich, blessed and rewarding life can be had by trusting in God and in God's kingdom here on earth. It was a significant moment in Jesus's ministry for the gathered crowd, the Jewish people, this image of Jesus sitting on a mountainside would have reminded them of Moses coming down the mountain, revealing God's law, the Ten Commandments. But in the Beatitudes, Jesus does not give a list of do's and don'ts. Instead, He's saying, this is how things really are and how the kingdom of God really works. Completely contrary to the world view, completely contrary to what the disciples had thought so far, to what the crowds had thought so far. Each beatitude is a proverb-like saying packed with meaning. Most scholars agree that they give us the picture of a true disciple of God. And indeed, Jesus' life is actually the embodiment of the beatitudes. If we went down each single one of them, we could say, yes, Jesus there, Jesus there, Jesus there. The Beatitudes weren't somebody is mourning or somebody is poor in spirit or somebody is this. It's a package and we all experience all of those things at different times. Let's take a look at each one. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The phrase poor in spirit speaks of a spiritual condition of poverty. 
not anything to do with being poor economically, but it gets to the heart of the people who are, their spirit has been downtrodden with whatever has happened to them, whatever circumstances have been fallen them. They could be traumatized, depressed, friendless, Blessed are they who humbly recognize their need for God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Those who mourn doesn't only apply to the grieving, but to any sense of loss breakdown of relationship, loss of faith, loss of self-esteem, or having the lingering effects of an unresolved issue or wrongdoing. And you're mourning over it because it has caused upset in your life from then on, and you have been unable to resolve it. Blessed are they, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, meek, if you say somebody is meek, we kind of think of a kind of negative, in a kind of negative sense, not much spunk. But in this sense, it's not that at all. It's all to do with those who show gentleness, self-control, non-violence. Blessed are they, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Those who work passionately for justice, a just society in which all are valued and respected. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Those who show mercy show it through kindness, forgiveness and compassion to others. Sometimes mercy is just looked upon as somebody's uh, done something bad to you, somebody's done wrong to you, and you show mercy um, by forgiveness. But it's more than that. It's this compassion. Somebody doesn't have to have done something bad to you. It's compassion for everybody that you meet. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Those who respond and act from the heart, and they have an inward holiness that only God can see. Everything comes from the heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. They are the people who work for reconciliation through peaceful, non-judgmental, prayerful ways. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Just as Jesus faced persecution, so will his followers. Blessed are those daring enough to openly live for Christ and suffer persecution. Jesus began his ministry with the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes would have arrested the attention immediately because it was revolutionary. And the rest of the sermon develops further the criterion of the blessed life. 
In this sermon, in the Beatitudes, in the whole sermon, the disciples would begin to understand that Jesus was calling them, and subsequently us, to live with the same kind of consciousness as he had permeated with God. People often say the Beatitudes and divide it up and say be attitudes and it is the attitudes that you have which sort of um, mark what kind of person you will be and the way that you live. So I think what we're called here to do is to have the right attitudes to be and to follow in the way of Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And we now look to Robert Burns. In a letter to Mrs. Frances Dunlop, Robert Burns wrote, whatever mitigates the woes or increases the happiness of others, this is my criterion of goodness. And whatever injures society or any individual in it, this is my measure of iniquity. God knows I'm no saint, but if I could, I would wipe all tears from all eyes. And of course there he's quoting from Re Revelation. Blessed are those who mourn. Why? has man the power to make his fellow man mourn. This was an ever-present perplexity for Burns, but he was certain of some greater purpose. And I take from his poem, Man Was Made to Mourn, the line, man's inhumanity to man makes countless thousands mourn and how so true that is of today. We just have to take the present day situation in the Ukraine to see man's inhumanity to man. Blessed are the pure in heart. Jesus and Robert Burns challenged the religious authorities of their times, speaking truth to power. The Jesus, in Jesus' case, it was the Pharisees, and in Burns' day, it was the Kirk elders and the leaders. Both Jesus and Robert Burns shunned hypocr uh, hypocrisy and the rigid laws and confronted them with it. Robert Burns highlighted it in Holy Willie's prayer, and we just saw that little extract and the picture of Holy Willie on the screen. And here's another little quote from the same poem, at the very end of the poem. But Lord, remember me and mine with mercies temporal and divine, that I for grace and gear may shine, excelled by name, and all the glory shall be thine. Amen. Amen. The cotter Saturday night worship around the ingle, uh, the spot around the ingle to um, get out the big Hall Bible in Burns's day. And Burns compares this religion's, religion's pride, that kind of religion we saw there, the false religion, the hypocritical religion in Holy Willy, but Burns compares this religious pride where the clergy display to the congregations devotions every grace except the heart. And there's another lovely little quote 
in the Cotter Saturday night, talking about the service there, the worship there. But happily, in some cottage far apart, God may hear, well pleased, the language of the soul. And in his book of life, the inmates poor enroll. God will put their names into his book of life, not the holy willies. Blessed are the meek. Those are the people that we said were, who were very quiet. They go back to my little notes there. Blessed are the meek, the gentleness, the self-control, and the non-violence. So in his epistle to Davy, Burns writes, it's knowing titles or in rank, it's knowing wealth like London Bank to purchase peace and rest. It's knowing making muckle mayor. It's knowing books, it's knowing lear, le learning to make us truly blessed. If happiness he not her seat and center in the breast, we may be wise or rich or great, but never can be blessed. No treasures nor pleasures could make us happy align. The heart's I, the part I, that maks us right or wrong. Burns spoke a lot about contentment. I find that it's not a word that's used very much these days. And here's another delightful little poem that I'm going to quote from um, by Burns, one that is very, very little known really, Bessie and her spinning wheel. And it begins, oh, leaves me on my spinning wheel, and oh, leaves me just mean blessings, blessings on my spinning wheel. This lady is so content, she's in her wee cottage, um, and she's got the, she's got her spinning wheel. She's probably spinning, maybe not just to clothe herself, but maybe for neighbours as well. And she is content, and she's got the lovely birds singing and the lovely river flowing by, and it's just so peaceful. Oh, leaves me on my spinning wheel. Oh, leaves me on my rock and reel. Free tap. Tete that cleats me bein and haps me bill and warm at een, blessed we content and milk and meal, oh leaves me on my spinning wheel, with small to sell and less to buy, up in distress, below envy. Oh, what would leave this humble state for all the pride of all the great amid their flaring idle toys, amid their cumbrous, dinsome joys? Can they the peace and pleasure feel? Oh, Bessie at her spinning wheel. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And righteousness, of course, we saw was all to do with um, righteousness was all to do with working for justice, working for a just society. And in the latter part of his life, we get Burns's really very political poetry and song. And definitely he was uh, writing for justice. He was writing for um, freedom from oppression. And he had to sometimes disguise some of his work because now he had a job with the excise and he had to guard what he said. Scots were he, 
Burns felt a kindred spirit with the early French revolutionaries with their cries for freedom and equality. Scots Wahey appears to refer to Bruce's address to the troops before Bannockburn, but is in fact an expression of desire for freedom from oppression in Scotland. He just uses Bruce as his mouthpiece to avoid losing his government job. In A Man's A Man For All That, Robert Burns' great song and poem about brotherhood. He gives dignity and worth to the poor and exposes the tinsel show of the aristocracy. The rank is but the guinea stamp. The man's the goad for all that. For all that and all that, their dignities and all that, the pith of sense and pride of worth are higher rank than all that. Burns saw a glorious vision of international brotherhood, founded on mutual comradeship and worth, mutual esteem and helpfulness, as the supreme blessing, the divine end, the universal and eternal plan of the author of all good, God. And I think perhaps, um, yes, I was about to say, to say the last verse of um, A Man's A Man For All That. Uh, can I get it started? So let us pray that come it may, as come it will for all that, that man to man, the world o'er, shall brothers be for all that. In the reading from the book of Micah, we are told what the Lord requires of us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. Over the coming weeks, if you feel disheartened by worrying events, watching too much of the news, and beginning to get disheartened and upset by it all, why not reflect on Micah's words, to do justice, to do what we can in our own situations, to love kindness and to walk humbly with God, and to reflect also on the Beatitudes, to step aside from the worries and concerns of life. And rather than focus on that, to reflect on God's blessings in our lives. Amen. Think on these things as you listen to the music.
You've heard Margaret speak of Scots Wahey. Burns wrote the lyrics in the form of a speech given by Robert the Bruce before the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314 to the traditional Scottish tune, Hey Tutitati, a traditional Scots air which, according to tradition, was played by Bruce's army at the Battle of Bannockburn. We are going to sing that tune today to words that are as far removed from military battle or national fervour as possible. The words of 1 Corinthians 13, Gracious Spirit, Holy Ghost. Burns wrote, O Thou who kindly dost provide for every creature's want, we bless Thee, God of nature wide, for all Thy goodness lent. And if it please Thee, heavenly guide, may never worst be sent, but whether granted or denied, Lord, bless us with content. And in those words, we offer to God our offering. Grant Good morning, one and all, and uh, welcome visitors that we have in our midst today. We hope you've enjoyed sharing in this one-off special kind of service, uh, which was because January has five Sundays in it, and we work on a monthly rota of services, and I just thought that being near to the 25th, this might be a good way of using our time. So my thanks to Margaret, to Lance, to Claire, who have all contributed and helped make this service possible. Uh, next week, uh, Fiona Kennedy, who's here, uh, will be leading the service. We're in, the, as I said, the Sermon on the Mount. She gets to do the bit about salt and light, and uh, the service will also include the celebration of the Sacrament of Communion. And that's because I'm on holiday as of today for a week, and I'll be back the following Sunday after that. All the things that you saw on the screen that are about what happens during the week, I hope you've made note of and are prepared to be part of if you so wish. Um, I'd like to say that somebody said, oh, I've, we've got a new session, Clark, but nobody said that yet. I've went on and on about this. Um, so again, I just keep saying, I need, a, we all need a session, Clark. 
And then we've had stuff uh, about things that are happening later in the year, like the Beetle Drive uh, in uh, Bartley Viewforth. But the new one that was up there today, which I'm drawing attention to, is that we have this uh, defibrillator out on the wall, and do you, everybody know how to use it? If you had somebody drop a heart attack in front of you and there was that thing on the wall, would you know what to do? Well, you should know what to do. And so there's going to be training given by the St. John's Scotland on the 15th of March in the small hall. It's a 50-minute a course that takes out of your life, but it would give you valuable information. You work with mannequin dummies that are responsive to what happens. So, you know, it's hands-on, I'll know what to do. However, it's uh, limited to 20 places. It's open to anybody. So if you want, want to do it, but you know people out there would love to know how to work a defibrillator, we'll give you them that opportunity. So you get in touch with Amy to book your place. I hope you will all think seriously about doing that. Uh, Don put up something in relation to uh, appeals, so no stamp collecting anymore required because the people that used to take them won't take them anymore. But the bottle tops, it seems, still can be collected. I didn't even know you were collecting bottle tops. This was new to me when this came in. But it all goes to raise money for Marie Curie and Macmillan Nurses um, and the Lavender Pro Trust. So that's a good idea. Um, you just don't put them into your recycling bin, put them into a wee bag and bring them to, to Dawn here in the church. I think that's all. Uh, the, my um, back page this week uh, shares stuff about my thoughts about today's service, but also future developments, mainly being planned with uh, Fiona uh, taking the lead. So there'll be more about those things that are in there, but have a look uh, on the back page, which is found on the website under the news tab. Right. The words of Burns that were on the screen during the uh, time for quiet reflection of a man, a, the world, the man to man, the world o'er shall brothers be for all that. Well, that's a prayer. And each new year across the world, other words of Burns have been sung. And at that point, that hand of friendship gets extended, even as they sing. And so with this image and those words in mind, I'm going to invite Doris to come and lead us in our prayers for others. A prayer of concern. Let us pray. God of all prophets, God of Christ, we are, I'm sorry, it's very small print this to what I'm used to, and I've just had uh, drops in my eye on Friday, so I'm finding it a bit different, but never mind, we'll get there. The world belongs to the rich are blessed, but reminds us that the blessed are us, the poor in spirit and materially poor as well. We pray for a meek and just world in which we have enough and come in behind. Excuse me, Margaret, could you take over? I'm sorry. Very sorry about that. Sorry about that. I'll just start again. Uh, yeah. God of the prophets, God of Christ, we are reminded today that your blessings do not necessarily follow the logic of the world. The world believes that the rich are blessed, but Jesus reminds us that it is the poor who are blessed, the poor in spirit and the material poor as well. We pray for a more just world in which all have enough 
and none are left behind. Global food producers, inner city and rural communities, essential workers in all our public services. Though we fear death and avoid its certain arrival, Jesus tells us that those who mourn are blessed. Help us to experience the truth of this mystery. Bring healing and wholeness to those who are sick and comfort those of us who have lost loved ones. Be with the families of Eric and Ian Morrison as they grieve the loss of their beloved mum and grandmother, Pat. While people covet power, Jesus blesses the meek. Guide us, O God, in the ways of humility. Help us to stand in solidarity with the oppressed and marginalised, the women of Afghanistan, refugees from many lands, victims of climate change. Show us your presence in the faces of those the world forgets, the homeless, the users of food banks, the invisible carers. Give us a hunger and thirst for righteousness. Fill our hearts with love, overflowing with mercy. Make our hearts pure and give us a vision of your glory. Renew through your Holy Spirit your Church of Scotland so that the life-changing gospel will once again be boldly proclaimed across the nation. In a society divided by race, gender, class, sexual orientation, and so many other labels we alone have created, remind us, that we are created in your image. Each of us a beautiful reflection of you. Each of us your beloved child. Help us then to end our conflicts and wars. Help us to be peacemakers and agents of reconciliation. By prayer and charity, may we support the work of Christian aid to end war in Ukraine, famine in East Africa, deliver climate justice for the world. Give us eyes to see the ways you are changing the world in which we live. Give us ears to hear your call to join with you in the great transformation. Hear us now, O God, as we pray for the coming of your kingdom, following Jesus as he taught us to pray. Our Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Thanks, Margaret. A man's a man for all that. We've heard that being said. It's reportedly based on the Bard song and the Jolly Bar the Beggars and was written in 1795, making it one of the last of Burns's big pieces. Burns said, a great critic on songs says that love and wine are the exclusive themes for songwriting. The following is a neither subject and consequently is no song but will be allowed, I think, to be two or three pretty good prose thoughts inverted into rhyme. 
It was set to an older Gaelic song called And I Can't Do Gaelic. Gilly do more mo Lachlan. Burns, Burns's words expressed a universal aspiration, but our hymn tells us how that aspiration will be accomplished. And just so that there's a little bit of continuity, we're going to conclude after the benediction singing the, word, uh, the tune, words to the tune of Aphon Kiss. The melody was originally Rory Dahl's Port, a triple time tune taken from Oswald and used by Robert Burns for his song. Rory Dahl was an ancient harper, originally from Ulster, who composed and played primarily in Scotland. So we are going to sing for my sake and the gospel go. worship is ended, depart in peace. Then homeward all take off their several ways. The youngling cotters retire to rest. The parent pair their secret homage pay and proffer up to heaven the warm request that he who stills the raven's clamorous nest and decks the lily fair in flowery pride would in his way his wisdom seize the best for them and for their little ones provide, but chiefly in their hearts with grace divine preside. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you to know his peace. Sinclair playing the, the uh, uh, 
extract for today, uh, there's something I want to share with you. As you're aware, the Presbyteries of the Church of Scotland are in the midst of uniting and reforming to reach a reduction in the number of ministers and buildings so that the future of the Church of Scotland might be sustainable. You may also know that the charge of Polworth is on a reviewable tenure, which means that when I reach the age of 66 in July of 2024, I will be required to retire. But the, uh, the Presbytery plan then directs that the group of which Polworth is a member will then begin reducing its ministry team towards two full-time ministers and one OLM looking after four congregations as they proceed towards a union. It had been my intention to retire in July 2024. However, it has recently become apparent that the most beneficial outcome for Sandra and me is to bring my retirement date forward by one year. So I am announcing today that following my return from holiday, I'll be writing to the Presbytery Clerk to request Presbytery's permission to demit my charge on the 31st of August, 2023, on the grounds of age. I will be continuing to work with the other four ministers who are also aware of my decision, and together we remain fully committed to establishing the best possible outcome for our four congregations. I'm making this announcement now to allow all parties involved to have the fullest time to consider the decisions that will need to be made. Meanwhile, I hope that we can enjoy these last months together, marking Lent, Easter, Pentecost, Christian Aid Week, the Canal Festival, and our Summer Sabbath, all the while giving thanks to God for God's goodness in the years that we have shared and looking forward with faith and hope to new things to come. Sorry to put a dampener on the end of a lovely service. Lance.